Hi, I'm Jack Ansel, and welcome to the Embedded Muse video blog, which is a companion to my free Embedded Muse e-newsletter. This is an oscilloscope from 1946. It's entirely analog, has practically no capability at all, and by today's standards would be considered a pretty crappy instrument. It cost $800 in today's dollars when it came out 70 years ago. Recently, though, several vendors have offered some tremendously capable scopes for half that price, and today we're going to look deeply into one of these. This is Siglent's STS-1102 CML digital oscilloscope. It's a 100 megahertz scope that costs an amazing $379. It's plastic, of course, like pretty much all modern scopes, but for that price you'd think it'd be kind of chintzy, but it's not. It's solid. It feels very well constructed. The buttons all have a very solid feel to them without any sort of sloppiness at all. It weighs just five pounds and it's quite small. Although the screen, as you can see, is a honest seven inches uh, of diagonal. The TFT, of course, it doesn't have a whole lot of resolution. It's uh, 480 by 234 pixels. But given that there's an 8-bit A to D converter, that sort of makes sense. There is a fan inside the device, but it's extremely quiet. I have to admit, I'm pretty smitten with the scope. I think the price-performance ratio is simply fantastic. I'm going to point out a couple of things I didn't really care for, but overall I think this is a definite winner of an instrument. So let's go ahead and see it in action. As I mentioned, it's a 100 megahertz scope and it samples at a giga sample per second. If you're using both vertical channels, that slows down to 500 million samples per second. The buffer is uh, 2 million points and this thing will sweep all the way down to 2.5 nanoseconds per division, which is pretty good. Now, if I'm talking about divisions, if you can see this, there's actually 18 boxes going across the screen, which is quite a bit different from most scopes where you have 10 going across. I'm not quite sure. Maybe that's metric or something. If I slow this down, we can look at the vertical channel here. The vertical sensitivity is displayed there. We're at one volt per division. As I change the sensitivity, it goes in a standard one, two, five sequence, like you see on most scopes. But if you press the button in, you get a fine adjustment. It changes just a little bit so you can really control how much of the waveform is displayed on the screen. It has a tremendous viewing angle. I mean, look at that. You can see this practically no matter where you are in a lab. One feature that's nice is the auto set. Now, all scopes today have some sort of an auto set. So if you get this in some weird mode, uh, you press auto and it brings it back. On most of the scopes I use, it brings it back to a mode I don't like. This one always seems to make a decent decision. And when you do that, it uh, allows you to select which triggering style you'd like using these buttons. I can clear that menu by pressing that button. One of the really nice features is if you press the horizontal button, you get a zoom. So there is our square wave being displayed, and here's a blown up section of it. I can change that. Or, of course, I can move the window across the screen so you can examine in great detail small sections of your waveforms. Now we're looking at a pulse, which is about 200 nanoseconds wide, to show off some of the triggering features. If I press the trigger button, we get this menu. This lets us set the type of uh, trigger. As you can see, we can do the normal edge triggering. And as I do that, this is one of the features that it doesn't, I don't really care for. This little select button here is extremely sensitive. Of course, maybe it's just that I drink too much coffee. Uh, regardless, so we can select to which channel, what kind of slope, and all of that. If we go to um, the pulse triggering mode, then we get the ability to select on the width of a pulse, whether it's greater than a particular width, equal to a width, or less than, I mean, all kinds of things. It's fantastic. So if I set that to uh, a greater than here, then we can set the width with this button and as I said, there's a 200 nanosecond pulse. It's going to trigger whenever there's more than a pulse more than 30 nanoseconds long. And of course, you can see it's triggering like crazy. As I crank this up, here yeah, I'm over 200 nanoseconds. It's no longer triggering. Okay, so that's, that's kind of cool. There's a similar feature with this slope triggering mode, where here you can set it to trigger on a rise time or a fall time, exceeding or being less than some value that you set in. Again, it's a very nice and useful feature for us digital people. The scope comes with two probes. I mean, they're nothing fancy, but they're, they're pretty decent. Um, if you were going to buy a probe from, say, Agilent, this is a nice, beautiful 500 megahertz probe, but this one probe costs 
approximately the same amount as the Siglent oscilloscope with the two supplied probes. So it's a pretty decent deal. But when we talk about things like bandwidth, this 100 megahertz that we keep talking about, what does that really mean? On most scopes, that's rated at the 3 dB point. In other words, half the signal is gone. So if you're looking at a 100 megahertz sine wave, that's 5 volts, don't be surprised if it's displayed at, at 2.5 volts, because that's a 3 dB down point. Sometimes people complain about this, but you know, it's the way all scopes are rated. It's just the nature of, of the beast. You just have to understand what is going on so that when you take measurements, you can correct for these factors. That's it for part one of the review of the Siglent SDS-1102 CML oscilloscope. Check back in the future for part two. And don't forget to check out lots more videos and more than a thousand articles about building embedded systems over at www.ganzel.com.